Can't sleep? Won't sleep? Afraid to sleep? Perhaps what you need is a story, a bedtime story, to lull you into the world of dreams, or maybe nightmares. Are the windows closed? Are your doors locked? Maybe you should keep a light on in the hallway, just in case. Now settle in, make yourself comfortable, lay back, close your eyes, and let me tell you a story. If you could see the future, would you change it? Would you have the confidence to know for sure that the choices you made wouldn't make things worse? It's a situation not far off from the time traveler's dilemma. If you could go back in time and stop a grievous wrong from happening, even if that wrong led to a multitude of good, would you? One man is about to face such a decision. He finds himself with the ability to see into the future, just far enough to make a difference, to keep bad things from happening. Should he? Isn't that playing God? The New Guy I was running late from my first official day on the job and didn't see the woman pushing the baby carriage out into the crosswalk until it was too late. The wheeled bassinet went flying through the air, and my SUV tilted slightly as the woman fell under my vehicle and I rolled over her before screeching to a stop. Only, that's not what actually happened. I slowed down as I approached the intersection, even though the light was green. The woman was distracted and didn't realize she was walking into traffic. I gave a polite honk on my horn, and she pulled back in plenty of time to avoid a certain tragedy. The woman gave me a grateful nod, and I smiled back as other less patient commuters leaned on their horns and raced around me. But that alternate moment, that bifurcation of reality that I experienced, had felt so real. The sounds, the heart-stopping shock of seeing the baby carriage tossed into oncoming traffic, the way my SUV pitched and jerked to a halt. Had I just daydreamed the whole thing in that fraction of a second before I took action to avoid the accident? Or did I just experience a premonition? I didn't have time to ponder the matter further. I was going to be late if I didn't keep going. So I drove on, putting the experience and the feelings it had engendered aside, focusing on getting across the train tracks ahead of me before the lights started flashing and the crossing arms descended. The bell started dinging just as I rolled over the tracks. How did I know that was going to happen? You couldn't see the trains coming from where I was on the road until you were right on the tracks. But I knew for a certainty that if I hadn't sped up, I would be caught behind a hundred car freighter. Coincidence, I assured myself. I had driven down this road a thousand times and knew that there was usually a few diesel engines dragging an endless caravan of intermodal containers behind them at this time of day. The job I didn't want to be late for was my first day on the security detail of the CEO of Quantum Pharmaceuticals. Franklin Forrest was one of the richest men in America, and possibly the world. I had been recommended for the job by a friend of mine who worked general security at the company's headquarters, a lavish campus of buildings and curated parks about 30 miles outside the city. That's where I was headed now. I pulled into the employee parking lot and hopped aboard one of the waiting shuttles just in time to be dropped off in front of the executive office building, with a few minutes to spare. Mac Isengard met me at the front door and guided me through the security station. I'd identified him by the badge clipped to his jacket. He was my immediate supervisor, the team leader, and I could tell by his demeanor that he wasn't pleased to have a new guy on his squad. Follow me, he said, leading me away from the reception desk and toward an unmarked door off in one corner. There was a scanner for a badge. Mac paused when we reached it, so I pressed my own ID against the featureless pad. The door clicked and I pushed it open and entered, holding it open for Mac. He shook his head. Never hold a door open for someone you don't know. You may think you know who I am, but until just a few seconds ago, we had never met. I could be anyone. Mac was right. I knew that. It was in the orientation materials I had reviewed the previous night. Sorry, I said meekly. Sorry we'll get you killed in this job, he warned. That's the last one you get. Yes, sir. Mac pointed at a locker. That's yours. Your communications gear and your weapons are inside. Press your thumb against the lock. I did so, and the light flashed from red to yellow and then green. The door to the locker sprung open. 
It's now key to you and you alone. He pressed his thumb against the biometric sensor of his own locker and pulled out his gun. He removed the magazine, inspected it, then slammed it back into the grip and made sure a round was chambered before sliding it into his shoulder holster. I did the same. On the top shelf was a bulky device that resembled a thick phone. From the orientation materials I had reviewed, I knew it was the multi-band communicator, which worked on radio, cellular, Wi-Fi, and Bluetooth data connections, so that no matter where you were on the sprawling campus of quantum pharmaceuticals, you would be connected to everyone else on the security team. I turned it on and slid the device into an inside pocket of my jacket, then placed the earpiece in my right ear. Comtest 1, I said quietly. The device replied, Communication status active. Max seemed unimpressed. He led me into a break room where three other men, also dressed in black suits with crisp white shirts, sat around a table sipping at cups of coffee. Two of them wore dark glasses. New guy, this is the team. Team, this is new guy, Max said. They regarded me suspiciously. He doesn't look familiar, one of them said. He's from outside. Used to be a cop, Mac explained. Shit, Chief, how are we expected to work with a total newbie? This comes from the top, so no complaints and make it work. That seemed to silence the others. I'd expected some resistance. It seemed to me being on the CEO's security detail was a plum assignment, and there was likely a long list of other people who worked in security at the company who coveted the very job I had walked into. I wasn't completely sure why I had been selected. It was a very unusual interview process. There was the usual, a questionnaire and a physical exam complete with blood tests and DNA swabs. After clearing those hurdles, I was called in for another test. I sat in a room while a series of images flashed on a screen in front of me. Then I was asked a series of questions. Then more images cycled by even faster. Then more questions. I wasn't quite sure what they were testing. The examination didn't seem to have anything to do with what I had seen. But however they scored it, I managed to pass. Finally, I was brought into a room with a well-dressed woman and a man in a lab coat sitting at a metal table. The woman motioned for me to sit as well. From her body language and her manner of speaking, I guessed she was a lawyer. Quantum Pharmaceuticals would like to make you an offer of employment, she said. Your starting salary will be $200,000 with a signing bonus of $25,000. She placed a document in front of me. Please review this and sign an initial where indicated. The papers had various flags stuck to them on different pages. I read through the first one and it spelled out my compensation, then skimmed through the sections about non-disclosure and confidentiality and expectations of maintaining certain fitness and weapons proficiency standards. There is also a section on benefits and time off rules. I initialed at all the indicated spaces, then when I reached the final page I signed my name and dated it. The woman picked it up and leafed through each page making sure I hadn't missed anything. Then she nodded at the man in the lab coat. He rose and pulled what looked like some kind of inoculation gun from the pocket of his lab coat with a small vial of purple liquid attached. What's that? I asked. Before I could get an answer, the man pressed the end of the device against my arm and pressed the trigger. It made a hissing sound as the fluid rapidly disappeared into my arm. What the hell? I protested, standing up rubbing the spot on my arm that was now intensely sore. What did you just do? That was a collection of vaccines. Your position requires frequent travel to many places that expect you to be protected against various diseases. It's all right here in the contract you signed, she added, offering the papers for me to inspect for myself. You could have given me a little warning, I said, kneading the ache out of my triceps. The woman ignored my complaint and handed me a thick binder filled with pages and various dividers. Here is your employee manual. It includes all of the security protocols you are expected to know. You will report for duty to Mac Isengard at the Executive Office Building at 8 a.m. tomorrow. I'm supposed to read all that by tomorrow? I asked. Again, this was clearly laid out in your contract, which you initialed and signed, the woman reminded me. I sighed, then took the binder and went home. I managed to make my way through all of the material, much of which was familiar because of my police background, before I reported for my first day and failed my first test of security policy when I held the door open for Mac. Now three more faces judged me a tight-knit group that probably had worked together for years, and now were being forced to add another member to their team. Don't get us killed, one of them, a man with a clean-shaven head and a thick mustache, warned. I thought it was Forrest we were supposed to keep alive, I replied. The one of the group, not wearing dark glasses, who had a buzz cut of red hair and a scar across one cheek, laughed. I like this kid, he said. Don't let them get to you, new guy. Follow orders, keep your head on swivel, and you'll do fine. By the way, I'm Vince. 
That guy over there with the cue ball head is Mikey, and the lump of muscle over there is meat. Mac raised his hand to silence all of us as he received a message through his communicator. All right, enough jabbering, he said. Let's get to work. Mac led us out a back door to a service elevator and up to the penthouse. We waited in a corridor in silence for nearly half an hour. Mac and the others seemed to be watching everything around them at once. I tried to do the same, employing the threat assessment techniques I had learned at the police academy. An ornate double door opened and Franklin Forrest appeared, followed by an entourage of assistants, including the lawyer I had met the previous day. Mac issued hand signals indicating that he and Vince would take the lead and the rest of us would follow in the rear. We went down the spacious private elevator reserved for the CEO, exited the building through the lobby, and approached the caravan of waiting cars. Forrest and most of his lackeys, along with Mac and Vince, got into a stretch limo, while Mikey, Meat, and I piled into an SUV parked ahead of it. We took off and drove about five miles till we reached a hospital. There appeared to be a ceremony taking place, and a banner thanking Quantum Pharmaceuticals for their generous donation to a new children's wing was hung prominently. There were television cameras present to record the brief speeches and the presentation of a plaque to Forrest. Then one of the administrators asked the CEO if he wouldn't mind taking a few minutes to visit with the children. They had their own thank you planned. Forrest was clearly not interested in the notion of spending any amount of time with sick kids, but he forced a smile and said graciously, Of course, that sounds wonderful. Meat snickered. He leaned over to Mikey and whispered, Fifty bucks says he's out there in less than a minute. Mikey thought about it for a second, then nodded. You're on. There's cameras. Apparently Forrest's obvious dislike for kids, or sick people, or both, was an ongoing source of amusement for the security detail. We followed a small group of hospital staff down a wide corridor. At the end of it, gleaming in gold letters on the wall, were the words, The Franklin Forrest Children's Wing. On the other side of the doors was a lobby area. A small group of kids, some standing, some in wheelchairs, all wearing hospital gowns, were arranged in two rows. Most of them had chemo-induced bald heads, and some were accompanied by IV stands. Once the group settled into place, the children began singing, We Are the World. Forrest smiled uncomfortably throughout the performance. When it was done, a young girl approached, carrying a large handmade thank you card, scribbled with various drawings and printed signatures. Thank you, Mr. Forrest, she said. Forrest kneeled down to her level and accepted the gift. Thank you, darling, he said sweetly. What's your name? The girl smiled meekly, then took on an ashen pallor. She stepped forward and vomited all over Forrest. Look what you've done. This is a $10,000 suit, Forrest exclaimed. The CEO roughly pushed the girl back. She fell down, smacking her head against the tile floor and began crying. A nurse rushed over to pick her up and carry her away. Mac approached the cameraman that had come to record the presentation. He snatched the video rig off the man's shoulder. Hey, you can't do that, the man protested. Vince stepped between the cameraman and Mac as the team leader removed the memory card from the camera. Mikey and Meat went into action, snatching phones out of the hands of a few nurses who had been recording the performance. They made sure the devices were clear of any evidence of Forrest's incident and returned them. I watched in shock and surprise. I had heard that Franklin Forrest had a reputation for having a temper, but I never imagined it would be exposed in a setting like this. Once Mac and the others were convinced they had cleaned up any evidence of the affair, Mac issued a command to leave into his communicator, which I heard through my earpiece. Since I was closest to the door we had come in through, I stepped forward to make sure the way was clear. A man burst into the room. He held a large glass beaker in his hands and shouted at Forrest, This is for all the millions you have experimented on to make your blood money! He hurled the contents of the beaker at the CEO. It hit him and those closest to him, and where it splashed, it burned dissolving skin and the muscle beneath. Forrest's eyes sizzled as the acid seared his cornea, and the fluids behind them leaked out. The CEO screamed in agony, raising his hands too late to protect himself from the attack. Mac and Vince drew their guns and emptied them into the attack. I stared at the door. No one had come through. Mac and Vince were escorting Forrest out of the room back toward the corridor. Wait, stop, I shouted. Mac looked at me impatiently. Out of the way, new guy. I turned to Vince. Keep him back. Then I approached the door so I could see through the small slit of a window down the corridor beyond. There was someone rapidly approaching. I got closer to the door, and just as it started to open, I kicked at it, knocking whoever was behind it onto the ground. Screams of agony issued forth from the other side. The nurses scrambled to get the rest of the children out of the lobby. What the hell was that? Mikey asked. He pushed past me to the open door. 
Lying on the floor was a man dressed as a hospital maintenance worker. To one side was a broken beaker, the contents of which must have been a highly corrosive liquid since there was a steaming hole where his chest had once been and his face and hands and clothing were pitted with burn marks. Back door, Max said immediately. We formed a phalanx around the CEO, who surprisingly didn't seem shocked by the thwarted attack, and by the time we got outside, the limo and the SUV had been moved to the rear of the hospital, and we all got into our respective vehicles and drove away. Mikey turned to me once we had gone about a mile. How did you know that guy was there? I saw him through the window, I said. Nah, Mikey protested. You didn't have an angle to see down the hall when you warned us. I guess I saw something. What's the big deal? Meat asked. You saved the boss. Sounds like a good day's work to me. When we got back to the executive office building, I was summoned up to Forrest's office alone. He gestured for me to sit on a couch while he perched himself on an armchair next to it. They tell me you're known as New Guy, he said. Yes, sir. Drop the sir. You saved my life. You can call me Frank. Okay, Frank? The CEO chuckled at the way I said it. Tell me what you saw, new guy. I saw what everyone else saw, I replied. Before that, he said. I could see in his eyes that he somehow knew about my premonition. I shrugged. I just had a feeling something bad was going to happen. Hmm, he said disbelievingly. How much of a warning did you have? Approximately how many seconds was it before you knew what was going to happen and what actually happened, he asked. I didn't answer. I didn't know how to. Horst leaned toward me. You're very special, new guy. We spent a long time and a lot of money searching for you. You hold the key to a whole new class of drugs that will take humanity to the next level. What do you mean? I asked. You have a certain combination of genes that have expressed themselves in just the right way to make you receptive to a new product we've been developing. I thought back to the purple liquid in the inoculation gun. You're experimenting on me? Forrest leaned back in his chair. You agreed to it when you signed your employment contract. And from what I've seen, it's worked beyond my wildest dreams. I was starting to get worried. What did you give me? I gave you the ability to see the future. I believe with time you'll be able to see further and have more control over what you see. Right now, your mind is adjusting to its new abilities. Abilities connected through quantum affinity to the future. What are you talking about? I asked. Oh, I'm not quite sure how it all works myself. But I have a building full of scientists who assure me they can induce a mutation in human beings that will amplify a dormant precognitive sense. And you are the first one to successfully realize that power. I shook my head. It was just a lucky guess. He smiled, a knowing grin that dismissed my denial as if I had never uttered it. I have quite a future planned for you, new guy, and there's a lot of money to be made in that future. Someone entered the room. I looked over and saw a woman standing nervously in the doorway. Forrest turned toward the door, but it was still closed. There was no one there. Was it a man or a woman you just saw? He asked. Woman, I replied, without thinking. Come in, Miss Holly, he shouted. The knob on the door opened, and the woman I thought I saw there a moment earlier stepped inside. I didn't know you were busy, Mr. Forrest, she said timidly. That's all right, please. I wanted to speak with you. She nervously approached, wringing her hands. I'm sorry about the hospital, she said. Forrest grinned again, this time menacingly. You told me it was going to be a simple ceremony. Then there were kids, sick kids, and someone tried to kill me. I had no way of knowing. They were just so grateful to you. No need to explain, Miss Holly. You're fired. Security will see you out. But, Mr. Forrest, it wasn't my fault. I... Get out, the CEO shouted. He stood towering over the shocked woman. Get your feeble little mind out of my office. She was frozen with fear. Forrest slapped her. She put a hand to the cheek that was struck and began crying. <laughs> oh, stop it. I didn't hurt you but I will if you spend one more second in my presence. The woman turned and fled. The heel of one shoe broke off, but she left it behind as she disappeared behind the door. Forrest turned to me with an exasperated expression. Good help is so hard to find, he said, then added, That will be all, new guy. I'll see you tomorrow. That night, I reviewed the non-disclosure and confidentiality clauses of my employment contract. 
I wasn't a lawyer, but it was clear that becoming a whistleblower to either Forrest's treatment of sick kids and employees or the experimentation I had been subject to would not be a smart move on my part, legally or fiscally. Quitting also triggered a severe penalty. I was trapped. When I reported for duty the next morning, the other guys were even more standoffish than they had been on my first day, except for Vince. He approached me while I was getting coffee. So, what did the big guy have to say? I cast him a suspicious look. You know I can't discuss anything that happens in that office. I assume you signed the same contract I did. He laughed. <laughs> oh, come on. You can tell us. We're not going to spill the beans. Nice try, I said, looking over at Mac. The team leader met my stare, then shrugged. My suspicion that the question was another test was vindicated. Big day today, Mac announced. Public event. Big announcement. A lot of people in press. We're going to be backed up by the B and C teams as well as some of the general security guards. What's going on? I asked. Haven't you been paying attention to the news? Vince answered. The boss is going to announce he's running for president today. He'll probably win, too, Meat said. Guys like him always come out on top. I heard speculation, but in the TV interviews Forrest had done, he had vehemently denied he had any political aspirations. Obviously, he had reconsidered. It's going to be here, on the steps in front of this building. Security teams have been sweeping the grounds and all the other structures for the past day. We'll have snipers posted on every rooftop, and no one gets near who hasn't been vetted and cleared, including employees. Right, like at the hospital, Mikey said. The hospital was a clusterfuck, Mac agreed. Today is not going to be anything like that. It's A-game all around. Got it? Everyone nodded. Mac passed out schedules printed on thin cards we could slip into our jacket pockets. He approached Vince. Listen, you're going to be on the primer today. The boss wants new guys as body man. Vince looked over at me. Mac had clearly said it so I could hear. No worries, Chief. I'd want him by my side, too. There were hundreds of people in the crowd. Signs proclaiming Forest for President, Women for Forest, Blacks for Forest, and Latinos for Forest had been passed out and were being waved eagerly by the attendees. There was red, white, and blue bunting on the building's facade and a podium had been erected in front of the main entrance. The news cameras had been relegated to a platform behind the crowd, and the signs were conveniently double-sided, so they were sure to see them. Meat and Mikey were positioned just off the podium to the sides, with Vince taking up the center front spot. Mac and I flanked Franklin as we waited just inside the headquarters building. I scanned the crowd from behind my sunglasses in my best impersonation of a Secret Service agent. The music changed from generic patriotic theme songs to a rousing fanfare. We escorted Franklin Forrest out onto the stage. Several other men and women in suits filled in seats behind the podium. The crowd erupted into cheers as Forrest came into view. The CEO waved at the crowd as he took up his position behind the lectern, with me off to his left and Mac on the other side. He smiled broadly and gestured for the excited supporters to settle down. My fellow Americans, he began, causing the crowd to erupt in mindless cheering once more. There was a distant crack which I recognized as a report of a sniper rifle. Had one of the rooftop teams spotted a threat and taken it out? Instinctively, I turned to Forrest to get him to safety, but the action pained me. I looked at my shoulder where there was a through-and-through -through bullet wound that was now seeping blood. Then I looked at the man I was supposed to protect and saw that I was too late. The bullet that had gone through me had hit him square in the chest, right through the heart. Forrest smiled broadly and gestured for the excited supporters to settle down. It hadn't happened yet. From my vision, I could tell the shot had come from a clump of trees off to my left. The assassin must have been planted there for more than a day waiting for his opportunity. I peered at the leads, trying to make out where the gunman was concealed. The man who had volunteered to risk his life to end the prospective tyranny of a Franklin Forest presidency looked through the scope of the high-powered rifle. He was surprised to see Forrest's body man looking straight at him, as if he knew exactly where he was. Had his cover been blown? Was he about to be taken out before he could complete his mission? Then, something strange happened. The bodyguard lowered his sunglasses and winked. The dark-suited man took a slight step to the side, giving the assassin a clear shot. He pulled the trigger, and Franklin Forrest died almost instantly from a bullet to the heart. Thank you for listening to The New Guy written especially for the Bedtime Stories for Insomniac's Fiction podcast by Rich Hosek. 
please remember to subscribe on your favorite podcast app or on Audible, and share these stories with your friends or anyone who enjoys audiobooks. Speaking of audiobooks, if you're a fan of the paranormal, Near Death, a rainy day investigation, is currently being serialized on this very podcast. New chapters are posted weekly, and you can find an entertaining review on the One Hour Book Club podcast. If you're looking for other original story podcasts, check out As Read By Me at, not surprisingly, asreadbyme.com. They have an eclectic mix of fiction, poetry, and essays that are sure to keep you entertained, all read by the authors. You can find out more about this podcast and the host of Bedtime Stories for Insomniacs at richhosick.com. Thanks again, and all the very best.